Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. In this episode, we do Imperialism Part 2, the events of imperialism. So we've talked about in Part 1 the philosophy of imperialism. Now we're going to talk about some specifics. So, India. We start with India. From the 1700s, the British and the French fight over India. The British East India Company dominates trade in India, replaces the Mughal Empire, the native, the natural Indian Empire, with local alliances. This is called the Raj, the British Raj, R-A-J. In this, the British East India Company, through its alliances, dominates the trade of tea, silk, cotton, opium, and other luxury consumables. Europe becomes flooded with stuff which had usually been hard to get luxury items from the Silk Road or from the Portuguese. Now it's a direct line right from Britain into right from India into Britain. This is doing very well for the British. They get involved in, in politics. They beat up enemies of their friends. They're they're the heavy. They even build an army. The British East India Company builds an army. It has a navy. And in 1856, there's the Sepoy Mutiny. Indian soldiers, who are both Hindu and Muslim, Indian soldiers try to kick out the Europeans. We're going to see this again and again and again. The idea of, if we want to be strong, we got to get rid of the Europeans. We have to got to kick them out. They are the problem. It failed. Why did it fail? Because, well, even India, as big as it is, was worth too much. And so the British just sent a new, they got had one army destroyed, they sent another army. It was worth too much. And the Europeans were too advanced. And even against Indian soldiers. And the sepoys were British trained soldiers. They are not bad soldiers. They are not like, you know, technologically lost and behind nobodies. These are the best native troops. So if you're going to fight them, you had they were using the same tactics, the same knowledge. They had the experience. So you had to send a real, the British had to send a real army, which meant Britain was going to put the screws to India. No more of this. Hands off. Let the British East India Company do what it wants. It is we, Britain, the government of king and parliament, is going to run India as a colony. It is part of Britain. Victoria becomes Empress of India. It becomes one of her titles. Why? So it could justify the British running it, running India. But I don't know what Britain is. 150th the size? 100th the population? There is no natural reason for Britain to be running India. It's 10,000 miles away. It's a tiny island. It's completely different culture and religion and belief system. And yet, it's no longer hands off. The British are going to run India, which means they need an administration. They need government officials. They need, they need Europeans to go to India to help run the show. But they're also going to need locals to help them. There's not enough Brits who want to go to India. To run India, it's too big. Britain can't swallow India the way it could say Wales. It, it well, you know, the way England did the Wales. It, it's too big. India's too big. And so you have to have administration. And then you need the way to connect. See, the ports were connected to Britain, but the interior of India weren't necessarily connected to the ports. And not in a way, in an economic way, but not in a political way that would help run the show, help move armies. And so you needed to suddenly build infrastructure. So the Brits start building railroads. They start turning. The idea was to turn India into a little brown Britain. They were going to run it that way. So what becomes is a military occupation. The British will have the best guns. The white British will be the officers. They'll be in charge. And then they do start to hire native Indians again. Muslims, Hindus. Because there's just not enough whites to do it. 
but you have a military occupation. And then you have the education of locals to help run India for Britain. These are our little brown brothers. Like, that's literally what they were called, our little brown brothers. That Gandhi will get a British education. He's a British lawyer working in the British Empire. And the idea was, the argument was, one day India will run itself. So we're going to train a generation of administrators who are going to like be apprentices. They're going to do the lower level stuff and then one day we'll leave and they could take over. Now that, that argument was always, we'll leave in five years and they never left in five years until like part three of our course. And, but the idea was there and this is one of the few places India remains one of the few places where the Europeans actually tried to help educate and create an infrastructure for an independent country. Whether or not they were serious and they really meant it in their heart of hearts that they would ever do it, they do do it. And so when India gets its independence, the fact that India fell apart so quickly is, is a, was a disaster because it should have been a place that quickly got up and running. You know, compared to the Congo, where it had 95% people were illiterate, where the Belgians did nothing. I mean, the Belgians will leave in 1960 and with double middle fingers on their way out on their helicopters, be like, ah, we'll be back next year. You'll beg us to come back. I mean, that's not India. India doesn't beg the British to come back. Except for, you know, um, cricket, in which case the Indians will whoop British butt. So it is one of the few places where the philosophy we will one day you will one day be independent actually the rubber was meeting the road not very well i mean in quality we're not talking well i mean the british really kind of dragged their feet on this in terms of quality but they did actually do it which is not how anybody treated africa or southeast asia what about China? Well, the Qing see what's the disaster that's happening. And so the Manchus try to close off trade. They're like, if we can keep the British out, we don't need anything. China's fine. We'll just keep you out. We'll, 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 we'll seal ourselves behind the Great Wall in the Northwest and the sea in the East. And we'll just be China, man. We'll wait for the Europeans to implode or something. We've been around for 5,000 years. We'll be around for another 5,000 years. The Europeans come and go. Problem is, Europeans weren't going to let them do that. It was too big of a market. It's 500 million people. And so the Europeans want to sell to it. And the British are the first. And the British have opium. A lot of opium. India produces a boatload of opium. And I'm, when I mean a boatload, I mean a thousand boatloads of opium. More opium than you can sell to all the people, the medicines and doctors in Europe. So it's got this trade imbalance with, with China. Because China doesn't buy anything from the Europeans. Remember, they're trying to close themselves off by being independent. But they do, because it's your drug. They do like opium because opium is a good drug. This is where heroin comes from, but also um, lots of painkillers. They are the best natural painkillers. And so the British say, buy our opium. And the Chinese say, no, man, you're, too, um, you're drug dealers. And the British say, dude, if you don't buy our opium, we're going to make you buy your opium because there are people they're Chinese people who want to buy our, your, our opium and you're stopping us. And we're not going to let that happen. And the Qing emperor says, yeah, they're drug users. We're trying to get them off of drugs and you're the drug pusher. 
So no, we're not going to buy your freaking opium. And Britain says, oh yeah? Boom. You get a series of wars, the opium wars. And China loses. Loses badly. Their navy is swept out of the sea. Their, their, their capital is, is shot at by the rivers. The, the British boats can go wherever they want. Can the British conquer China? No. But it's a humiliation. And the Europeans know they can't run China. It's too big. And it's too, too, it would be too hard. It's bad enough running India. All they want to do is sell and make money. And so there's this humiliation. But the British are Europeans. And they think in that European way. And so the emperor's like, oh, you're humiliated me. You're forcing me to do this unfair treaty. What do I get out of this? I get nothing. And the British are like, what do you mean you get nothing? Empy. Mr. Ching. You're the emperor. You get 20%. And the emperor's like, uh, but it's your goods and you're forcing me to have to buy them. You're forcing Chinese people to have to buy them. And they're like, yeah, but you're still the emperor. You still have a government. You're still allowed to charge sales tax, man. Everything that the people buy, you get 20%. And here, we'll help you. We'll collect the 20% for you. And we'll give it to you just to show you that we don't want to run the show. We just want to sell our goods. And here's the crazy thing, because you're like, oh, that's crazy. The Europeans are going to actually charge their businesses 20%. They're going to collect that money. And the answer is, yeah, they did. They were more honest in their collection of taxes than the Qing bureaucrats were. Because the Qing bureaucrats are out in the field. They don't want to anger people. The British could care less if they angered people. They're just selling goods. So they collected the 20%. And every month it gets dumped into the bank vaults for the emperor. And so the emperor loves and hates the Europeans. And loves to hate the Europeans. Because here's the problem. The emperor is getting rich off the European trade, which nobody likes. So the emperor can't kick the Europeans out. To kick the Europeans out is to lose all of that revenue, all of that money. And yet to let the Europeans stay is a humiliation. It's to say we are too weak. The emperor is too weak. So to dislike for the people to dislike the Europeans, which a lot of people do, you start to dislike the emperor. If he can't kick the Europeans out, he's either likes the Europeans or he's too weak to kick them out. Either way, we don't need this guy. And so in the 1860s, you have a series of rebellions. You have the Taiping Civil War, the Taiping Rebellion. It's called rebellion, but 20 million people are dead. It took 20 years to put it down. It's a civil war. And it starts as a Christian rebellion. And Christian is in quotes because the guy says he's a brother to Jesus. I mean, he's Christian, but in that kind of assimilating Christianity in a way that works in an Eastern philosophy sort of way. Um, but the idea was you can see these ideas, these European ideas coming through. Even if they're being converted by the native peoples, they're, they're flowing through people's philosophies and then being changed. So the idea is to throw out the foreigners, to throw out the emperor, take over the government, and then throw out the Europeans. These rebellions are just to throw out the, the, the foreigners, the Europeans. In 1900, there's another one, the Boxer Rebellion. In which case, it's explicit. This is a, this, where the Taiping Civil War starts in, the, in the, the countryside. The Boxer Rebellion is in the port cities, and they literally go after the Europeans. European merchants, European sailors, European priests, they go after the Europeans. The end of the Boxer Rebellion is multiple countries, including the United States, invade China. 
invade the ports to protect the Europeans, to protect white people, and then the force to save the emperor. Not to force the emperor. The emperor is more or less on their side, even though I know it's complicated. This is a 102 class. There is a, a group that wants to overthrow and and become more powerful in the... It, it's a complicated situation. But the idea is the Europeans save the emperor, which makes shows the emperor is even weaker. Because it shows the Europe the, the emperor is choosing the white people over his own people. And that is going to lead ten years later to the end of the Chinese dynasty, of the Qing dynasty. Because the European economy dominates Chinese politics, and that is seen as humiliation. And basically within ten years the political idea, the political center is we don't need an emperor anymore. He, the, the emperor is not helping us. It's not saving us. So it's time to get rid of him and create, use a European governmental system, a republic, in order to tap into the nationalism of Chinese people in order to throw out the Europeans. And that we're going to talk about in the 20th century. What about Africa? Africa in the 1800s and afterwards. Well, the Europeans invaded the coasts. See, all those coastal European, the coastal Africans that were working with the Europeans, they're all like, oh, we're independent, we're rich, the Europeans love us. And then the Europeans start showing up with guns and steamboats that can go up the rivers. Suddenly, they don't need those coastal Africans anymore that we talked about in the, in the New World section. Now they start conquering those people, and then they start going up the rivers. And then, in some places, they start settling. The French settle in Algeria. The French settle in Tunisia. A million French people are going to be in Algeria. They become part of France. The British settle in South Africa and Kenya because they were very European climates. Resistance, any resistance, equals war. That war equals defeat. In almost everywhere. One exception is Ethiopia against the Italians. But African victories, of which there are a few, Islanawana, I-S-A-N-D-L-W-A-N-A, -A -A, in South Africa in 1879, or Khartoum, K-H-A-T-A-R-T-K-H-A-R-T-O-U-M in 1885. The British just came back with bigger armies and bigger guns and more supplies. And they just crushed the armies that had defeated their, their previous cousins, their previous friends, the previous army units. And so resistance, it didn't matter. Great, resist. The Europeans were going to crush you anyway. African labor was used to build, to especially extract minerals. Wages were paid, which allowed for generational conflict. So we talked about earlier using different ethnic groups. In Africa, you could also do the rich, the young versus the old. Because the old, for because of slavery and various other things, old men dominated the economies. They had much more wealth than young men. And so polygamy allowed older men to marry women who were much younger than they were, which locked young men out of the marriage trade of better of of better economies and so the europeans show up and say we'll pay you we'll give you we'll give you cash we'll give you british pounds french francs which is worth more than whatever you you could buy cattle with it you could be the richest man in town and so instead of the young and the old of a small town working together to kick the british out the young go and work in the mines the young pick up guns and work in the army. And then they come back and they oppress the old. They break up that monopoly of power that the old people in the town had. So that makes them European allies. The young people become European allies in a lot of these African places. It's a divide and conquer. They support minorities, as we ex explained. They have indigenous allies. So Europeans are helping some people. The indigenous people are helping Europeans. And the effect is 
an economy that's being tied to Europe. This ties the African to European economic system for the first time really since Rome. The Roman Empire owned North Africa and went down the Nile. So the African, North African and East African world were tied somewhat to the, Euro, to the Roman period. That broke away when Islam conquered North Africa and East Africa. And now it's replacing, it's come back. The Europeans have returned. Well, remember our good old friend racism and white nationalism and social Darwinism? Well, it matters in Africa a little bit, but like the Europeans were in charge. The place where it only really matters is where you have large number of settlers. And that's Algeria and South Africa. And in South Africa, you get apartheid. A-P-A-R-T-H-E-I-D. Which is just racism. But it's not, it doesn't mean racism. It means separation. It means to live apart. But basically, the idea is it separates whites from non-whites. Now, that's not white from blacks because there is a large number of what's called colored people. People who are biracial, basically. Or Indian or non, non-distinguishable. So, so it's the separation of whites from non-whites, according to apartheid. If you're white, you get all the rights. If you're not white, you get some definition of why, of rights until you become black. When you're black, and this is going to be scientifically looked upon, and I'll talk, talk about this in a second, then you get no rights. Now, what does the scientific social Darwinism mean? It means they had a definition of what is black. So they would measure people's nose. They would measure the brows of their, their, their foreheads. They would measure things and have a scale on color because if you were colored, then you had certain rights. Not a lot, but some. But if you were black, you had no rights. And that's how crazy apartheid is. And you may go, that sounds vaguely familiar. And it should, because that's American ghettos in the North and Jim Crow in the South. It doesn't have the scientific component. Because in America, if you were what South Africans would have called colored, if you were biracial, you still had no rights. Unless you could pass as white, you were black. That one, what's called the one drop rule. If you had any black blood in you, you were you were black. But that's not exactly true either. If you could pass as white, you could be white. So, but that's how the American ghettos worked in the North, where you separated each other out. You did not live together. Italians lived in this section. Uh, Spanish lived in that section. Irish lived in that section. Is there mixing a little bit flow sure but you it's a ghetto for a reason the majority of the people living in that area were of one ethnic or religious group the jim crow south had jim crow it separated whites were on one side of the tracks you know african americans blacks were on the other side of the tracks and the idea was you had separate everything separate stores separate restaurants separate drinking fountains that separation is apartheid. And it's more entrenched in America and older in America than it was in South Africa. Now, it will last longer in South Africa than the what happens in the 60s in G- the Jim Crow South, and that kind of ends it. But apartheid will last until the early 90s. Um. And we'll talk about what happens with decolonization. But there's a linkage here that is not unseen at the time. You know. What about Japan? Well, Japan is the only country, only non-European country that's going to industrialize. In the 1500s, like, it's closed to trade. It wanted to keep out most Europeans. There's one place where the Dutch are able to trade but it's not very much. Um, 
in the 1850s, the USA shows up and the USA is late to this. And so most of Asia is already taken over except for Japan. And the USA shows up and says, uh, you're going to trade with us. And Japan says, no. And says, if you don't, we're going to blow stuff up. And they have their big guns on their giant steamships. And they say, okay, 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 okay. Japan is scared. And that scared becomes we have to change. If we do not change, 20 years ago, this is what happened to China. This is what's happened in Vietnam. This is what's happened in Formosa and then Korea. If we don't change, we will be the rest of Asia. And so there's a short civil war between the reformers who have the backing of the emperor and the conservatives, the Tokugawa, who want just lock down, kick out. We could, we could kick out the Europeans. We could kick out these Americans. It's not going to be that hard. They have to come at 8,000 miles. We can kick them out. Won't be hard. This is your last samurai, the movie The Last Samurai, because you know who wins? The Meiji one, M-E-J-I, the Meiji Restoration. A young emperor with his liberals supporter overthrow the conservative Tokugawa. And they start an immediate industrialization and change. The idea is to become European. So how do you do that? with no experience, with no knowledge, with none of the European history. Well, what they do is copy, 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 copy. They copy the best. The German army, the British Navy, American factories, American education. They, they do the best. And you may go, wait, American education? Well, in 1900, American progressive education is probably the most advanced in the world. This is Dewey. This is, you know... Is it man, M-A-N-N, man? Um, in 1900, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, American education is liberal, democratic, progressive. So, and it's, it's a reason why the American industrialization expands so rapidly and so quickly into so many different industries. The thing that they don't copy, though, is religion. The emperor remains important, the head of the religion, and the people remain Zen Buddhist. There's Shintoism and the such, but it's still part of that natural Buddhism that Japan has. They don't take on Christianity. Christianity has almost no success in Japan. So it's interesting, they copy everything but the religion. Now, the problem with that is they need resources for industry. Well, what do the Europeans do? They conquer other people and take their stuff. We need to conquer other people and take their stuff. And so in 1898, there's war with China. That's victory. It equals Japan takes over Korea. The Russians don't like Japan taking over Korea. And the Russians are like, wait a minute, you're Asian. You're not that important. And so in 1905, there's a war between Russia and Japan. Japan wins that one. Victory. So they get to hold on to um, Korea. They're going to expand into Manchuria, into northern China, where the Qing come from. So that's a humiliation for the Qing. They beat up the Russians. So that's a humiliation for Russia. And what that 1905 victory, that victory over China and Russia meant was Japan gets to sit at the big boys' table. They're the smallest of the big boys, but they get to sit at the big boys' table. You want to do conservative Metternich diplomacy in Asia? The Japanese get to sit. They get to have a say. They get to be part of the treaty. They get to be in the room where it happens. Not China doesn't. Korea doesn't. Uh, Vietnam doesn't. India doesn't. Japan does. They're the only non-European country to industrialize. Factory, steel. And you have a Japan, and this is going to be important for what's going to happen in part two of this class. You have a Japan that thinks of itself as European, as white, and is looking for respect because there's racism and social Darwinism. So the Europeans like, you're part of the club, but you're not really one of us. And the Japanese like, F you we are. In fact, we're 
better than you. Because you needed a thousand years to industrialize. We did it in 40. If we can do that in 40, and it took you 500 years to conquer an empire, what do you think we can do in 100 years? So you have a Japan looking for respect in a racist world. And that is going to get us to 1915, and especially the 1930s and 40s. And so we are left with a world that the Europeans run. European culture is becoming the de facto world culture. The Europeans won. They won the world. In p This ends part one of our class. In part two of our class, we're going to talk about the benefits of the Europeans running the world and then how the Europeans lost it. And they're going to lose it in mass slaughter of each other. Be careful. Thank you. See you soon and be safe.